Uh, all right, so we're back. We're booking the, back in the book of John, chapter 5. I'm enjoying it. Uh, some of you are probably enjoying it when we get to it. Now, I understand we have breaks. But uh, John, chapter 5. Uh, today, and if you're, don't worry, we're not getting through the whole message. That's okay. Um, last week was a little extra long. It was Israel, but um, now you can clock me. Okay. So, um, oh, yeah. John, chapter 5. This little section, we've just finished a, a couple other sections. John, we're at John chapter 5. I almost see it today like a, not a trial, but like a trial. There is the witness for the prosecution. That's a great old-time movie. Anyway, witness for the prosecution. And then there's the witnesses for the defense. John chapter 5, it seems like John is bringing into a court the witnesses for the defense. He's bringing into a court the witnesses for who Yeshua is. He's proving who Yeshua is. And Yeshua and John are showing us all the witness for the prosecution. Mankind against Yeshua, against God. And so we see that going on right now in chapter 5. I'm thinking of trials, and I thought of uh, the movie Les Mis. Some of you may have seen it. There's about four or five different versions. It's really, really great. But I'm thinking of one trial scene in Les Mis. The main character, Jean Valjean, um, he uh, was arrested for stealing a loaf of bread back in France in the 18th century. And anyway, so he, is, he, he breaks his parole, he leaves his place, and he becomes a very, very wealthy magistrate, a great man, a great man doing great things. Um, but they find out, in a town nearby, they find a guy they said is Jean Valjean, who broke his parole, and he's being put on trial. And when they put him on trial... They have the witnesses that are proving who he is, Jean Valjean. And so he feels guilty because he's very well, and, but if they get this fake Jean Valjean, he's free for his life for, forever. But he goes to the trial, and at the trial, they have these witnesses, witnesses that come and say that this homeless, down-and-out man is Jean Valjean. And so they're going to take him away and convict him of breaking his parole, and he'll never be heard of again. But the real Jean Valjean is there, the magistrate, they're honoring him, and he watches this, and he finally goes forward, and he presents the case that he is the real Jean Valjean. And he shows who he is. They don't believe it, but he's... And I'm seeing, you know, you get the witnesses that were not credible. They were saying he is the, the guilty part. This man is the guilty party. You see the same thing with the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Saul. He stands in the book of Acts, um, where he is standing before Felix, Festus, and the rest of us. What was that? Uh, Felix, Festus, the rest of us? No, that's the, the movie. Okay, the television show. Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. And so there's witnesses against him, witnesses to prosecute him. And then he, there's not too many witnesses, he himself, Rabbi Saul, is his own witness. And we, we see one of the trials here in... Um, in uh, Acts chapter 24. Actually, when he was there and the Roman governors get together, they say this man might have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar because his witness was credible. The false witnesses, the Jewish community, were against him. So all I'm trying, if you're confused, good. The only thing I'm trying to show is that there's witnesses for and against. And so with Rabbi Saul, it says in ja uh, Acts 24, 10, when the governor nodded for him to speak, the witnesses against him already spoke. Paul responded, uh, knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense to you. He's making his defense who he is and what he is. And if it had just been up to his witness, he would have been set free. But he, he appealed to Caesar. Now we see the same thing. John chapter 5. We see not a trial per se, but John who's writing, Yeshua who's speaking, is telling us there are certain people against him. And then we're going to see the witnesses for Yeshua. And that's what we're going to get more of the witnesses for Yeshua next week. But we'll start today here. Uh, John in chapter 5, he's saying this. I believe this is what he's trying to tell us. That we should accept. We have it up there? Good. We should accept. And remember, the book of John, that's what the whole book is. Almost every week you're going to hear me say this. We should accept and believe in Yeshua. Because John, you remember, John chapter 20, he's writing these things that took place so that you might believe that Yeshua, everything in John is that you might believe. Seven major miracles. So that you may believe, 
John speak into the world, that you might believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the son of David, and that by believing you would have life in his name. John writes that you might believe. So almost every week, we're going to see a similar uh, main idea. We should accept and believe in Yeshua because of his, or the witnesses, and we're going to see what those witnesses are. There are five. We're not going to get them today, but they're the five, the witnesses. Because of his uh, proper witness and the testimony that actually comes from God. God's going to send forth his witnesses. So in a sense, we're going to set it up sort of like a trial. So the first thing we're going to see is that I'm going to deal with here is that we're going to have the wrong witnesses, or, or like I would like to think, is the uh, witness for the prosecution against Yeshua. And so the first thing we're going to see is the wrong testimony. The, war, the, the uh, prosecution is going first. Why Yeshua is not the Messiah. And so we're going to see this in John 5. So we see the wrong testimony, the wrong witness, which comes from man, mankind. So if we're talking to trial, they say, can the next witness come forward to, for the prosecution? So the first witness is mankind. That's, that's what we're seeing in John here. The first witness, bring forth mankind. What does he have to say? And so fill it in here. The wrong testimony. This is mankind's uh, witness. Man's, the first thing we see about man, man's witness is his nature and his testimony. Man does not have a good uh, background. Man does not have a good uh, testimony. Mankind. And that's what we're going to see here, that Yeshua knew it. And John was saying, according to the Bible, man's testimony is marred. Man's testimony is not good. It's been marred for thousands of years. Ever since the first man, Adam, ever since, he, uh, ever since he sinned, we see that it's affected mankind. Um, Adam was the only man ever who was able not to sin. You get that? Adam was able not to sin. He didn't have to give into it. He gave into it, and he's caused all of us since him to only be able to sin. Some more or less, we can still do some good things, but we still have to sin. That's in our nature. Mankind's nature. We go naturally, and that's what I'm going to show you here in this first part. Man's nature is always to turn away. Man's nature is always to do the wrong. We do not have a good, good history going on. Um, we've been marred. Um, we, uh, we are depraved in every aspect of our being. That doesn't mean we don't do good things. But sin has affected every part of you and me. Body, soul, spirit. We naturally go in the wrong direction. What do I mean by that? God is one direction. We naturally go away from God. We na that's our natural tendency. So here we see um, every part. After Adam sinned, you could trace it in the Bible, you see the results of that. You see Cain kills his brother. Then after that, we see Noah, every thought of mankind was only to do sin and evil. We see Israel's history. Israel always going in the direction. You know, I'm purposely painting this black as possible, uh, as dark as possible, because mankind sins. Mankind goes away from God. And usually their testimony or their witness is not reliable, is not credible. Mankind has gone away. Look with me now in John chapter 5, verse 38. We read, um, John writes, speaking of Yeshua, um, he says, you do not have his word abiding in you. Just stop for a minute. I divide the world to two bubbles. The left bubble, all the world, all the people who've ever lived. Everyone's in. You and I were once in that bubble. Then there's the right bubble. This is the body of Messiah. All those who were in that bubble once, now they've accepted Messiah. They've put their trust in him. And they're part of the new body of Messiah. We have God's word abiding in us. We have God's spirit abiding in us. We, according to Corinthians, can know the thoughts in the mind of God. We th we're not better. God has done something. These people over here do not have God's word abiding in them. A number of years ago, I remember speaking sort of like this, and one person who was visiting, did not believe in Yeshua, was very, very upset with me, how I painted the picture of a non-believer so dark. Because... The non-believer does not know God, folks. Does not know God. Now, that means they could be good people, 
good Jewish people, good Catholic people, good all kinds of things, good people, but they do not know God. They don't have a vision for God. They don't communicate with God. They're far, far away. There's a block because of sin. Mankind, we have God's word abiding in us. We know God. We communicate with God. We have a vision. We understand. Now, it doesn't mean we can't go astray and do wrong, but we have a relationship with God that the rest of the world does not. Today, people naturally do not believe in God, do not believe in God's message, do not believe in God's messenger. Mankind rejects. And so we see in John here, the witness uh, in John 5, the witness is against Yeshua because mankind naturally goes against him. Um, in, the, in the message that Stephen gives in Acts chapter 7, and it's a, you could study it, there's a theme going through Acts chapter 7, and he's saying to the Jewish people who are arresting him and they're going to stone him and kill Stephen, they say, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You always resist God. Because that you resist God, his message, and his messenger. You always are resisting him. And that's the whole theme of that. And really, it's the theme of mankind. We always resist God. We naturally go away. Unless God does a miracle. Unless you sit back there, and I was thinking about this. So what made me turn to the Lord? If I'm so dark, and I can't do good, and I don't know good and, uh, God, and, and I don't communicate with God, and I have no vision for God, what makes me different than anyone else? I don't know. God's Spirit picked me up, and he took care of me. That's what he did. Unless God saw, does something, there's no hope. So that's why you need to pray for the lost, that God would touch their hearts and soul. Only God can do that. Uh, Stephen's message, he said to the Jewish community when they're arresting him, they say, first, God raised up Joseph. God's message, God's messenger. You resisted him, and you turned on him. Then after Joseph, um, there was Moses. You resisted God. You resisted God's message. You resisted God's... You're naturally going in the wrong direction. That mankind's testimony, mankind, you and the world's witness, is not very reliable. And so we read here in John 5, 38, it says, uh, you do not have his word abiding in you, the rest of the world who do not believe in you do not have God's word abiding in him. You do not believe in him whom he sent. That's how you have God's word. God sent Yeshua. You put your trust in him. Or we, that's what we do. God, I believe I've sinned against you. I believe you sent the Messiah, Yeshua, to die for me. I now want to receive you and put my trust in you. At that moment, God's spirit comes in to live in you. You move residences from the left bubble to the right bubble. You become a believer, and now you can know God. Listen carefully. They can't know God. They can't have a relationship with God. It's just what they've drummed up in their mind. Only by faith in Yeshua can you have a relationship with God. That, so mankind has turned away. Follow along in John chapter 1, verse 9. John, he, he overlaps much, much, much of his message. John chapter 1, 9. There was the true light, Yeshua, which coming into the world enlightens every man. I, I love that verse. You know, listen. This part of this world, left bubble, if you're not a believer in Yeshua, I love you. You're blind. You can't see God. You can't know God. Yeshua came in the world to open our eyes. Only in Him can you be, have your eyes opened and understanding about God. The rest of the world says, you are brainwashed. Thank God I'm brainwashed by God. January 15th, 1972, that strange day, God opened my eyes. And I moved into the body of believers. And I went home that night as a believer. And I said, I'm one of them now. I knew nothing could change it. I knew I had a relationship with God. And I knew everyone was going to criticize me. My family, friends, everyone was going to criticize me, saying I'm brainwashed. And then I'm backward. And you're just following along with these people. But now it says, Yeshua coming into the world, he enlightens every man. Yeshua is the one. It's the picture of the Hanukkah menorah, Hanukkah. You light the top light, which is the servant. That light is the only one who gets He lights all the other lights on the menorah. Because Yeshua is the light of the world, and they can only be lit by Yeshua. And it says, he was in the world. Um, 
uh, and he enlightens every man. He was in the world, the Messiah. The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. The Messiah can't. The world can't know God. That's why I remember one of my teachers saying, you work, you share your faith, you talk to people like it all depends on you. You pray, you, you, re, uh, you, you share your good, the message of Yeshua, you, you work for the, to reach the lost. You do everything you can, but you pray like it all depends on God. You work like it all depends on you, but you pray like it all depends on God. You share your faith. I've shared many times with people, with the non-believers, and I felt good. I felt like, oh, Lord, you're doing good. You're giving me the right thoughts, the right message, the right verses. Oh, they're, they give an objection. Boom, I'm getting back. I get them. They, they don't stand a chance. And I felt powerful. I felt this power of the Holy Spirit. And I said, this person, ah, I got him good. And I said, so, would you like to receive Yeshua now as your Messiah? No. No. Then there's the other people I'm sharing with. I said, wow, you're doing a bad job. You're not remembering the verses. You're not co coherent. You're not fluid. You're not, you're not making any sense. And everything is bad. You're not sharing the good news. Good. And then all of a sudden they look at me and go, can I pray to receive the Lord? Because it all depends on God. God is the one who does it. Work like it all depends on you. Depend like, pray like it all depends on God. Uh, verse 11. Yeshua, he came to his own. There's a discussion whether it means the Jewish people or the mankind. He came to his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. Jewish people did not receive him. The world did not receive him because man naturally rejects God, his message, his messenger. We, thought, we talk about Isaiah. Isaiah, I mean, the book is great. It's a masterpiece. The whole Bible is a masterpiece. But Isaiah, he's the prince of all of them, it seems like. You think Isaiah... You know, when he was around, oh, Isaiah, oh, mighty Isaiah, you're wonderful. They, they all bowed down to, to Isaiah. Um, Isaiah, they put in a hollow tree, and they sawed him in half. It wasn't popular to be a prophet. You usually die. Isaiah was Manasseh the king, and probably the people behind him uh, stood to kill him. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, they did everything to Jeremiah. Just read that book and just see what he suffered, because Mankind is not reliable. Mankind turns away from God, turns away from God's message, turns away from God's messenger. Ezekiel, what he went through, forget, laying on his side for 300 and some days, I don't know. And then the other side, uh, what the prophets go through is incredible because they don't naturally accept God. Chapter uh, John 2. But Yeshua, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. Yeshua his witness, his testimony, he didn't depend on mankind. He knew what was in man. He knew that man's nature was marred. He knew that man's nature was naturally... He didn't trust in man because he knew what was in him. And it says, he knew what was in man. But it says, uh, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew who he was. So John is just telling us that Yeshua didn't need man to testify who he is. Yeshua knew who he was. And he didn't need mankind's testimony. Uh, one of my favorite verses that I quote quite a lot about mankind is found in Ezek uh, Ecclesiastes. Follow along. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29. Behold, I have found only this, that God has made man upright. God made us right. God made us right with Adam. God gives us the direction. God gives us what is good and right and holy and pure. God made man upright, but we... We have sought out many devices. All this is saying is, God made us right, but we question and turn away from God. That's what mankind does. We naturally go away from God. Um, Romans chapter 1 puts it this way, similar. Uh, this is the witness of mankind. We don't trust mankind. We pray for them, we love them, we share the message. Don't trust mankind's message because, again, mankind without God is dark. Mankind doesn't know God. And you have to realize that when you're sharing, people just don't understand. And so, uh, look what the Rabbi Saul writes in Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, God created the world, I love the way he phrases here, his invisible attributes. You don't see God. 
I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing God, but if you want to see God and learn about God and want to know what God is like, you know what you do. You study about Yeshua because he's the image, exact representation of God. If you want to know about God, you read more about Yeshua. But So God is invisible. You can't see the Father. You can't, we saw the Son, but you can't see the Father. But he is invisible. His power, can't see his power. His uh, presence, can't see him. Uh, his knowledge, just can't understand that. It's not part of us. He is individual at his mercy, his uh, compassion, his love, his invisible attribute. You can't see God's attributes. But, Rabbi Saul says, his eternal power, part of his attributes, his divine nature have been clearly seen. I love the way he says that. You can't see it, but it's clearly seen. The way he writes that. What's clearly seen? They're being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Rabbi Saul is saying, if you look at creation, if you look at space, if you look at the universe, and then there's a book and I, uh, that I recommend also, uh, is it Fearfully and Wonderfully Made? A doctor writes this book on the human body. And he takes different parts of the body, each chapter, the eye, the circulatory system, the heart. And he deals with each one. And when you see space, and you see mankind, and you see our bodies, you have to come to the conclusion, you have to come to the conclusion that there's a God who did all this. It just couldn't happen otherwise. And so that's what Rabbi Saul is saying. God's invisible. You could see his, who he is through what has been made. So that the world is without excuse. What he's saying is the world should naturally say, God, I can't see you, but I see you. I need to turn to you. And that's what he's saying here. Verse 21, Romans 1. For even though the world knew God, they did not remember because God made us upright. You know, people talk about the evolution or de-evolution of uh, religion and faith in God. People say, well, you know, man was made primitive and we developed into the knowledge of God. But really, that's the opposite of what took place in the world. We've devolved away from God revealed himself. God made himself known. Mankind has gone constantly away from God. And it says here in verse 21, even though they knew God, created us with the knowledge of him, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, mankind became fools. They turned away from God. Verse 23, and they exchanged the glory of God, of the incorruptible God, for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You started off right, and we turned away. They've turned away from God. John 5 is telling us, mankind is not, mankind is not a reliable source. And Yeshua knew that. And, and it says, chapter 5, 41, Yeshua says, I don't receive glory. Another translation another for glory might be praise. Another word would be actually better. And it says, I don't receive praise from men. Yeshua was not looking for men to prove who he was. He had other witnesses. He had other testimonies, which we're going to go, which is really exciting, the way God provides the witnesses that we'll get to more next week. I, uh, I do not receive glory from men or praise from men. It was really just saying, I've had, because they're wrong. But I know you, John and Yeshua says, I know you, that you have... Uh, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. You've turned away from God. Now, people think that I have a, a bad, twisted, uh, wrong view of mankind, especially the far left. The far left. They believe in the goodness, the kindness of mankind. The Bible does not tell us that. The Bible tells us we naturally are not good and kind. We naturally go astray. And that's what I've been saying. The testimony of the witness of man is not reliable since Adam. And it says in John, um, Jeremiah 17, 9. 17, 9. The heart of mankind is deceitful above all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Man naturally goes away unless God intervenes. So if you're a believer today and you have a relationship with God and you know God and you read his word and you pray and you have an understanding of who God is, doesn't mean we have all knowledge and all wisdom. And yet, be thankful. Because it's not possible to get to this point unless God did a miracle. And that's what I, I realized in my own life. I was, I was in Philadelphia, minding my own business. 
or everybody else's business. And I was doing my own thing. I wasn't seeking God. The world doesn't seek for God. We seek for our own man's praise, our own glory, going the wrong direction. God reached down. I like to describe it, a waterfall. Oh, big, big waterfall. Picture Niagara Falls, big waterfall. All of mankind is on top there, and we're rushing down, going over the waterfall. All of mankind. We're all going over the, and we're going down. And God looks down, and he sees me. And he picks me up, or he sees you. He picks you up and puts you up on the shore, or the top. What do you say, everyone? Thank you. And then you start praying, Lord, can you reach so-and-so, so-and-so? Because we naturally go astray. We don't normally go in God's direction. And so, um, who can understand it? My life, your life, you are not seeking God. Even though you think you were seeking God, God was seeking you. When you say, well, no, Larry, you're wrong. I went to a Bible study. I was listening to believers. I was doing this. That was God's mercy, folks. That was God reaching for you. You were desperately sick. You were desperate without knowing God. But he saw. He said, why me? I don't know. Well, it says because of God's grace and mercy. He reached down to us. The picture of mankind, the best picture of mankind, and you should write this down because at least, you know, at least you'll know where it comes from. It was written by a Jewish, uh, a Jewish rabbi, but there's the only kind of rabbis, okay? And in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 3, he, this great rabbi describes the heart and nature of man and the works of man. And it says, Romans 3, Rabbi Saul says, What then? Are we better than they? In the context, he's saying, are we Jewish people who have God's revelation? Are we better than the Gentiles? And he answers, not at all. God forbid. For we have already charged that both Jew and Greek are all sinful, are all under sin. Then he gives a little bit of the nature of mankind. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The word righteous there means being in the body of Messiah, being given God's righteousness being saved. Not one. All of us, all mankind for all ages are there. And there's only, no one is righteous on his own. And then he gives us uh, the nature of man. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Nobody seeks for God. He seeks for you. All will be turned aside. Together they have become useless. There's not, uh, there's none who does good. There's not even one. So he tells us the nature of man. We are dark. We're depraved. We're separated from God. Then he says, let me show you what we do, how you act. You say, look, I'm not as depraved as Larry is. He's, he was really bad. But, you know, so then the rabbi explains what you do. This is what you're like. Not as bad as Larry, but this is what you're like. And he goes on. Their throat, what comes out of our mouths, is an open grave. Nice, that's the description. Your throat's an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. He's given a description of all of us. This is mankind. This is the testimony of mankind. Destruction and misery are in their paths. The paths of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So, always saying, John is telling us, Yeshua is telling us, mankind is not a good, reliable witness of who Yeshua is. Well, where do I get that? That you'll get from God. But who does mankind naturally choose? You know, in sharing with Jewish people, a lot of times they've said to me, Jewish people, if Yeshua was the Messiah, picture if he's the Messiah, and he came to set man free and to do good and wonderful things, if he's the Messiah, wouldn't our Jewish people believe in him? And our answer is, no, because we choose the wrong. Mankind goes in the wrong direction. We choose the wrong one. If Yeshua was the Messiah, he should be rejected. If they accepted him, he wouldn't be the Messiah. Because mankind chooses wrong. So who does mankind choose? That's what we're going to hear. Mankind chooses. Follow along with me. Man's choice and his witness. John 5, 43. I have come, I have come in my Father's name. It's a great phrase when you look at it. Um, Yeshua didn't come for his own purposes. Yeshua didn't come with his own agenda. Yeshua was sent from the Father and the Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to come to the earth to do the Father's will. 
That's all He chooses to do. In a sense, that's our, our message for all of us. You and I are here to do God's will in this lifetime. Um, my definition of success, everyone, for all of us, your purpose on earth is to find out what the will of God for you is and do it. That's successful. Finding out God's will for you. And so, uh, he says, I come here to do God's will. Mankind's nature is to do their will, to turn away from God. Yeshua came, I came to do the Father's will. He says, you do not receive me. Everyone, why? Why doesn't the world receive Yeshua? Everyone, tell me, anyone. Because we go the wrong direction. We choose the wrong one. We choose the wrong people. We go naturally away from God. You choose the wrong, unless God chooses you. God chooses you, then we, we, we believe in him. He says, we naturally, uh, if, if another comes in his own name, you'll receive the wrong one. Mankind is unreliable. They choose the wrong one. And he says, how can you believe, Yeshua says, when you receive glory or praise from one another? You're seeking man's praise. You're seeking man's glory, not God's. And you don't seek the glory that is from the one and only God. You're seeking the wrong. Man naturally chooses the wrong. Throughout history, did you know there's many false messiahs that people buy, buy into? Mankind naturally goes in the wrong direction. We see even more clear today, with, which you're going to see more and more with my updates on insanity. But uh, look at me in the book of Acts chapter 5. We see, for some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody and a group of about 400 men joined up with him but he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing mankind always not always tends to choose the wrong one Gamaliel said again Acts 5.37 after Thutis came another one Judas in Galilee of Galilee he rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him another movement he too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. After them was the Jewish man by the name of Bar Kokhba. In about 135 AD, another man rose up, and Rabbi Akiba and the Jewish community and all the people followed, Rabbi, uh, followed Bar Kokhba because mankind naturally chooses the wrong. That's why I tell people it's so important for you to wake up every morning and pray. Lord, I'm going to choose the wrong today. I'm going to do wrong. I need your help. Direct me today. Whatever I do, whatever job God has given you to do, Lord, I need your direction. I need for you to hold my hand. Depend on him. I need to read the word of God to help clear my mind. It's, an, it's so important that you constantly refresh yourself with the word of God by talking to him and reading the word. And so that we naturally choose the wrong one. Throughout history, there have been false messiahs all the time. Um, Matthew chapter 27. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any prisoner whom they wanted. And uh, at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Yeshua? I think this is a, a mini picture of the whole world. And it says, who do you want me to release? Messiah, the savior of the world, or a killer, Barabbas. For Pilate knew that they just for envy they handed him up. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas to put Yeshua to death. The governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Mankind is not reliable. Mankind turns away from Yeshua. Mankind today thinks you and I who believe in the Bible, who believe in Yeshua, thinks we are brainwashed. And it's going to get worse and worse. Uh, Daniel 9.27 tells us about a person the world's going to accept. For he, whoever this he is, which I'll tell you in a minute, he is going to make a firm covenant with the many for, for one week. Um, in the future, there's a tribulation period. And one is going to be a one world leader. He's going to rise up. He's what we know as the anti-Messiah, the false Messiah. And the world's going to follow him. And it, and for this middle of uh, this whole week of the tribulation, they're going to follow him. In the middle of the week, he's going to put a uh, an end to the sacrifices. And it says um, he's going to make a covenant with the Jewish people for, for one week. Mankind chooses wrong. 
Revelation 13, 1. And the dragon, another word for the devil, stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up, that's the anti-Messiah, coming out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and his heads were blasphemous names. Revelation 13, 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. It's not a pretty picture the way mankind goes. It's not a reliable picture. Do not trust in mankind. The psalmist says, don't put your trust in horses. Don't put your trust in chariots. But put your trust in the Lord. He says, "Those, uh, the whole world will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life, the uh, book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Unless God intervenes, we go naturally in the wrong direction. Mankind is not reliable to look to. Mankind chooses the wrong. So God says, now, that's the case for the prosecution. We go in the wrong direction. What is the case for the defense? Follow along. I think I'm going to try to get this one in here if I can. Yeah, okay. Uh, Let's call the witnesses for God. The right, I have down here, the right and proper testimony, the witness from God. Okay, we're in the court. So they say to the defense, who's your first witness? It's actually coming from God. The first witness, right there. Yohanan the Immerser is the witness of Yeshua. The first witness that God brings forth is what we call, as we know, John the Baptist. God calls forth the first witness. There are five witnesses. Five witnesses. We're going to get to maybe today one. Next week, the next four witnesses that God is going to present. As present in John, because what is John doing, everyone? He is writing so that you might believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you might have life in his name. It's so strongly put. You know, there's only one way to have life. Only one way to have eternal life. Have a relationship with God. There's only one way to know God. To talk to God. To to read his word. There's only one way to communicate. You must be a believer in Messiah. First witness, come forward. So, Yochanan the Immerser. John the Baptist, he comes forward. Follow along, John 5, 22. Yeshua and John say this, there's another who testifies of me and I know that uh, the testimony which he gives about me is true. John came forth and he was the one who was the witness of Yeshua. Um, They asked John, why are you here? Who sent you? The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, book of Isaiah, chapter 40, John tells us who he is, but follow along in uh, Isaiah chapter 40. This is who John is. It was predicted 700 years before John came. Isaiah 40 verse 3. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. He's going to turn people back to God. Let every valley be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a plain. The rugged uh, terrain, uh, a broad valley. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. John came to prepare the world for the Messiah. He's the first witness. We have to turn to see what John said. When we get a picture in in the book of John, John is the first one called. Follow along with me uh, in John 5, verse 33. Yeshua, John says, You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Well, who sent, who's, who sent? When John was preparing the way for Messiah, he came to the earth, and the whole world started, was curious about who Yochanan, John the Immerser was, because he was preaching, turning, telling the people, turn back to God. Turn back to God. You need to repent of your sins and turn back to God. And so the whole world at that time was going out to John. He was immersing them in the Jordan River. And so the Jewish leaders came, sent by the Pharisees. Who are you? What are you doing? What is your message? And John is telling them, he says, he's a voice uh, according to Isaiah. Follow along, John 1. This is his testimony. This is the testimony of John. When the Jewish people sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And the show, um, the chosen, brings us out well. Because the Jewish leaders send people to find out, who is this Yeshua? Who is this John, actually? And John is telling them about Yeshua. And John says this. He confessed and did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Messiah. Who are you then? He said, I'm a voice. 
and goes on. And he quotes, uh, we'll see here, John 1, 19, uh, 21. I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? You know, why would they say Elijah? Because that's found in our scriptures in the book of Malachi. Before the Lord comes, Elijah the prophet will come. And so the Jewish people knew that. And in a sense, John was fulfilling the role of Elijah, but he says, no, I'm not Elijah. Elijah will probably come, or someone like Elijah, before the Messiah in the second coming. He said, are you Elijah? And he answered, no, not Elijah. He says, well, are you the prophet? Where does that come from? Deuteronomy 18. Moses said there's going to be a prophet like me, who stands in the face of, face-to-face with God, there's going to be a prophet. So all the Jewish community always looked forward to either Elijah coming or the prophet who would turn us all back to God. So the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're like, are you preparing us for a Messiah? Are you the Elijah? Are you the prophet? He answered. He answered, no, I'm not that. John 1, this is his testimony. And they said to him, who are you then? so that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Verse 23. He said, and he's quoting Isaiah 40 that I just read. He said, I'm a voice, just a voice, crying in the wilderness. God was raised up by, I'm sorry, John was raised up by God to prepare the world for the Messiah. He was a voice. He was different than mankind. He was God's representative. And he's the first testimony. And he says, I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said, verse 24, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They wanted to know about John. They were curious. I don't think they weren't serious. But they asked him and said to him, why then are you immersing? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing, uh, preparing the people for God's coming if you're, not, if you're not the Messiah? You're not Elijah. You're not the prophet. And John answered them saying, I immerse you in water. Because John, his witnesses, I have come to prepare you for the Messiah. That's the first witness. We're just listening to what John had said. He says, I immerse you in water, but someone stands among you. I love this phrase. You do not know. One among whom you do not know, he is the one who comes after me. The thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to, unti- uh, to uh, untie. John is preparing them. The first witness, John's on the stand. I'm a voice. I'm preparing you for the Messiah. And he goes on. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was immersing. Now, I'm going to take a little quick side tack if I can. Uh, I'm thinking of doing a trip, just to let you know, for for Shuba next year. So, yeah, if you want. It's going to be a small trip. I'm going to try to keep it to about 25, maybe 30. But some of you who want, you've wanted for a long time. I haven't done a trip since, actually didn't do it in 2020 either, 2019. But there's one site, Fran's not particularly fond of this site, but I like to go to this site. I take you, because we weren't allowed there before. It was controlled in the West Bank uh, by the Jordanians, and we weren't allowed there. I like to go to this one site. The reason I'm saying that, because in this verse here, it says, these things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was immersing. We go to that site. I really enjoy seeing that site. Now, it's a dirty site. It's not clean. The water, is it mud, Fran, or is it silt and mud? It's not great. No, it's not good at all. But I love going to this site. It's a little bigger than Jordan there. It's dirty. Um, seating's okay. It's not, and, and, and so for, what do you see in this? I love this site because this site is where Joshua, right around here, within a couple miles, crossed the Jordan with the Jewish people. And so we read the part in Joshua uh, chapter, I think, 2 and 3, where Joshua uh, stopped up the Jordan River and he crossed. I love saying, reading these portions. Joshua stopped up the Jordan River there, God did, and they passed through it, similar to Moses. It's a great, great sight to see what Joshua did. Then, in the same site, the same area, I like to go there, I want you to think back about 2,700 years ago, Elijah the prophet, he came to this site. With Elisha, his, uh, his top man, his servant. And they went there. And uh, the Bible tells us that uh, Elijah first stopped at Jericho, first Bethel, then Jericho, then it said, and then he went to the, this site on the Jordan River. And this is the site where, El, El, I never know how to say Elisha or Elisha, anyway, um, where he said to Elijah, 
I want a double portion of what you have. And Elisha said to him, that's a hard thing. I don't know if God's going to grant you that, but if you see me go, you got it. So we go up to the, where do they come? To the Jordan, right where we are. This is a significant sight. And they come there, and it tells us that Elijah threw down his mantle, Jordan parted. Listen, Moses didn't part the Jordan, he parted the Red Sea, but Joshua parted the Jordan here. Elijah parted the Jordan. This is a significant place. And Elijah goes up, and Elisha sees him go up. And God, it's interesting, because if you trace, just by chance, if you trace Elijah's miracles, Eli, Elisha, Elisha get twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And he got a double portion. But this is the site. This is where Elijah went up to heaven. And it's nice to stand in that area. Joshua came here with the Jewish people. Elijah and Elisha came here right to the spot. This is where Yohanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, he came to immerse the people. So it's a significant sight. When we're reading John chapter, where is it? Where are we? John chapter 1 here? Yeah. John, it says, they came where John was immersing. This is the sight. What's that have to do with his witness? Nothing. But I just wanted to tell you that. Then that just in case you were thinking that. Because later you're going to go home and say, Larry, why did you say that? I'm telling you. Because I thought it was nice. Okay. And if you go with me, we're going to go to that site. That's right. And then you're going to say, but the water's dirty. And forget it. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Yeshua coming to him. This is John's testimony. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a loaded statement. John came, and he's giving us his testimony. John chapter 5 is telling us what John said. John chapter 1 is telling us. He was there immersing people, and he looked at Yeshua when Yeshua came to him. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, as John said that to the Jewish people, they probably were familiar with Isaiah chapter 53, where it says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. All our sorrows and pains were placed on him, and by his scourging, by his stripes, by his death, we are healed. John, with all the people, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Jewish leaders, and all the people, points to Yeshua. He says, Isaiah 53, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was sent by God. Here's the first witness. Isaiah 53. John was saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Jewish people would understand it. John was referring to Isaiah 53. John was referring to the Passover. The Lamb of God. Take the lamb. Shed the blood. Take the hyssop. Dip it in the blood. Put it on the doorpost. Put it in the upper portion. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We just got through with Passover. John was referring to Isaiah 53. John pointed them all back. To God, John, Yochanan, the Immersers, witness is true. It's not mankind's witness. Mankind takes us away from God. John is pointing us to God. That's what the writer of John, not John of Heaven, is telling us. And it says, um, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53. It's referring to the Passover. He, John is saying to all the people at that time, this is the one who all the sacrifices point to. All the sacrifices in Leviticus. Leviticus is a tough book to get through. At least for me. You, you're different. You're much smarter, so you understand Leviticus. But Leviticus is not an easy book to get through. When I get to Leviticus, I, I know the first seven chapters. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Uh, whole burnt sacrifice. Guilt offering. Tras trespass. Thanksgiving. Votive. I don't know what votive is. Anyway, all kinds of sacrifices. And John is saying, when he says the Lamb of God, he's saying Isaiah 53. He's saying Passover. He's saying all the book of Leviticus, all the sacrifices point to Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Don't trust in man's testimony. Trust first God sent Yochanan the Immerser. John 1, chapter 1, verse 19, uh, verse 30. He goes on. This is he, John speaking of Yeshua, pointing to Yeshua, of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I did, for he existed before me. Great phrase. Yeshua always existed. Yeshua was not just born in Bethlehem. People get it confused. They say, well, Yeshua first came to Bethlehem. No, he didn't. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, Behold, yeah, not behold, but you, thank you, 
you get up here and you try to remember. Anyway, um, Bethlehem, uh, the five two. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you're too little to be among the mighty clans of Judah. Yet from you, Bethlehem, small, little, insignificant village, yet from you will come forth for me, for God, the one who's to be ruler in Israel. Then it tells us, his goings forth, the verse Micah 5, 2 is telling us, he's born in Bethlehem, but his going forth, his origin, where does he really come from? And then he says, his going forth are from the days of old, from the days of eternity. Yeshua always existed. Get that in our minds. He was born in Bethlehem as a man. He always existed. God the Father did not create Yeshua. Yeshua always existed. And John is saying that he is much more important. He has a higher rank because he always existed. Isaiah chapter 9, 6 tells us about Yeshua. 700 years before he came. Uh, John 9, 6 says, a son, a child's going to be born. A son is going to be given. This one, the government of Israel is going to be on his shoulders. And his name is going to be called. Anyone? Wonderful counselor. You should know it by Hebrew. It's just so good. Pele awaits. Wonderful counselor. Then it says this child that will be born is going to be called the mighty God, El Gabor. And then the phrase says, Aviad, the father of eternity. Yeshua has a higher rank than John because he always existed. He had no beginning and no end. Yeshua has always existed. He'd also be called the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Um, and with Micah 5, 2, it says, he had no beginning, no end. This is John's testimony of Yeshua. And then we will... Uh, I'll read the verse... Yeah, the next verse. Um, 1931. I didn't recognize him, John says. Uh, but so that he might be shown to Israel, I came immersing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to immerse in water said, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon this one, is, uh, the one this is the one who immerses in the Holy Spirit. I may myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The witness for the prosecution is unreliable. Mankind goes astray. Mankind chooses the wrong. God says, let me give a case for Israel. Let me give a case for the Israel's Messiah. Let me give a case for the, who the Messiah is. I'm going to bring forth my witnesses. First witness, according to the book of John, is Yochanan. Don't get those two Johns. You get confused in case you are. There's John, the writer of the book, and there's separate John, the immerser. God brings forth the witness for the defense. First witness is John. I came that you might have life, that, I, that you might believe in Messiah Yeshua. Next week, the case continues, the trial continues, as we see God's next four witnesses. That you might believe Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God. All those who believe in him might have life. Father God, we thank you for the testimony here. Not of mankind, but the testimony of God. And that you sent first, our first witness, Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. And he came to reveal Yeshua to us. He came to speak of the Lamb of God. He came to speak of the one who always existed. We see God's first witness and testimony. Lord, we ask today that your witness might speak to the hearts of man, that we might listen to the words of God through John, who said, Behold the Lamb of God, Yeshua, who takes away the sin of the world. Father God, we thank you for his testimony. We ask that anyone here who's just on the verge, they've heard the message a lot. But right now we pray, Lord, that you would speak to their heart and that they might quietly in their heart say, I believe I've sinned. I believe Yeshua died for me. I now want to put my trust in him. We thank you for these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Hi, I'm Rabbi Larry Feldman from Shuva Israel in Irvine, California. Click here on the round Shuva logo to subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss a Shuva video. Toda B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach.